Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, this week's uh, live stream where we are thinking deeply about Christianity and hopefully gaining a better understanding of what Christianity teaches. This is actually going to be a second part on a conversation that was started a few weeks ago with Bill McKeever on the differences between Christianity and Mormonism. We, we talked a lot about the history behind it. We talked about the archaeology. We talked about the Book of Mormon. Uh, but one thing I really wanted to focus on is some of the differences as far as who is God, who is Jesus, more specifically, who what is they view uh, grace as being and what did Jesus do on, on the cross and how does salvation work. And so that's going to be the topic today as we look at the, the Mormon versus Christian views of grace and salvation, hopefully gaining a better understanding of what Christianity teaches about grace and salvation, as well as giving you a very practical, easy to use approach to have conversations with your Mormon family, friends, neighbors uh, on the topic of salvation and helping point them to the true picture of uh, the biblical grace. So to do that, to help me have this conversation, is Pastor Lauren Pankratz. He has his degree from Chapman University in religion and philosophy. He then went on to Princeton Theological Seminary to get his Master's of Divinity and then received his Doctorate of Ministry from Talbot School of Theology. He has contributed a chapter to this book, Sharing the Good News with Mormons, Practical Strategies for Getting the Conversation Started. Uh, that came out about two years ago when I had Eric Johnson, one of the editors, along with Sean McDowell, on to discuss the book in general, uh, but now focusing in kind of on his chapter on a salvation approach. How do you focus on salvation with Mormons? So uh, let me bring him on here to join us. Lauren, thank you so much for coming hey, on. You bet. Thanks for having me. Appreciate yeah, it. absolutely. So it's great getting to see you again. Uh, Lauren is uh, living out in Utah. That is where he is the pastor of the Bridge uh, community. And the Bridge community and Lauren really does a lot of work with Maven, with Brett Kunkel. And so that's where I initially met you uh, out in Utah and uh, yeah. and you giving a presentation to our students on what we're going to talk about today in our video, as well as you do some incredible work. So I'd love for you really quickly, just kind of share like uh, about your church. Um, we'll kind of get to your story here in just a moment, but just about your church and kind of what you do uh, there in Utah and, and how does um, kind of, I guess, how do you mix the, the, the preaching of the gospel and the Christian church as well as mm -hmm. what is the church like in your city? I know there's not very many Christian churches and then how you go about inviting Mormons in and, and, and reaching, you know, the LDS community. Sure. Uh, there's a lot there. Let me just yeah. give you a little brief uh, snippet here. So we launched our church 2011 and uh, we were on site here in Utah for about 18 months before that, but it took a little bit to gather a launch team. And uh, so we do ministry here in Utah. I've been doing that now for a little over 10 years, but uh, our church has a, a very pro gospel approach. Our, our mantra or, you know, on our signage out front, it just says simply Jesus and uh, that's really what we try to embody here. We as a church are not here to um, uh, bash uh, our, our Mormon neighbors and Mormon friends. We, are, uh, we take their faith seriously, and we think that they have a sincere faith. Yeah. Uh, we, we think that at, at the root, um, that is uh, out of line with what Scripture teaches, and so we want to offer the gospel to them, and so we want to be as clear about what the gospel is, and uh, and how it's uh, maybe different from what they've grown, what many of our neighbors have grown up for, or grown up with. Because like like you mentioned, our our church is the only evangelical church here in Centerville, and um, it's the only evangelical church. Uh, you know, there, there's just there's a, there's not a lot of of, uh, of evangelical churches here in Centerville. Yeah. Um, Probably 85% Mormon, something like that, uh, in the area, and uh, um, and that would go for all of South Davis. There are a couple other Christian churches, but they're few and far between. But there are a plethora of churches that are just, um, um, you know, they're just LDS. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think, you know, that's kind of important to point out. I think it's just so fascinating is the work that you do and how you are able to bring uh, the gospel. Talk about the true picture of grace uh, in a community that doesn't have very many evangelical churches. And one thing I wanted to talk about in my last conversation with Bill McKeever, and we just kind of it didn't flow in that direction, was how... Um, when often having conversations with Mormons. Now, I'm, I'm, uh, we, we have a lot of the same vocabulary. Uh, we talk about God and Jesus and salvation and grace and, and atonement and all this kind of stuff. But one thing that's so important and I frequently tell people is you have to recognize there's two different dictionaries. Uh, the Mormons use a very different uh, definition for these terms than you do. And so I'm assuming that on your church, where it says simply Jesus, uh, the, the, the Mormon community is probably not going to take exception 
but they probably are going to understand that in a very different way, right? Absolutely. Yeah, you're exactly right. And uh, that was one of the frustrations early on in a ministry here in Utah is uh, whether that was on short-term mission trips or uh, while we're planting a church. One of the things that we uh, bump up against all the time is that we use the very same words as you're saying, but we have very different background definitions of what those words mean. And that makes uh, real communication very difficult. Yeah. So if you were uh, a missionary in um, in China, uh, you wouldn't just go around preaching in English because <laughs> the words wouldn't make any sense to them, right? And there's almost a, a similar thing that goes on here that as we preach in English here, though they hear the words, they're hearing the sounds, but what uh, many people are interpreting by those words and sounds is shaped by a very different theological uh, tradition. And so it makes it a little difficult for the Christian evangelist or someone who's wanting to share the gospel here. It's a, there's an extra step involved, and that's kind of exegeting the culture, learning how they use the words and what they mean so that we can better uh, present the gospel in a way that they'll actually hear and understand. Yeah. No, I think that's uh, that's wonderful, and so um, and that's you know kind of uh, as you shared with me, and I understand is it's, it's so important to kind of have those definitions, and that's what we're talking about today. Is it, I think even in my last conversation, uh, there's a comment of, "Hey, well, I believe that Je I'm saved by Jesus too," and yeah. again, very different picture that we have to understand, and I think can lead to right. a very practical strategy that we're going to be talking about as we think deeply about Christianity and Mormonism today. Um, so let, yeah. I, I, maybe just start off right here really quick, as you mentioned, um, your church simply. Jesus Jesus. Um, how yep. is the Mormon going to understand when you talk about Jesus? How are they going to understand Jesus? Because again, they, you often hear uh, them say things like, hey, well, Jesus Christ is in our church name, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So how For sure. briefly is, is the Christian view of Jesus and the Mormon view of Jesus different? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, like you're saying, just from the very get-go, we're going to run into some problems. Um, uh, the, the Mormon might say that they're saved by the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross, and they're saved by grace that flows from that as they trust in him. And to an evangelical, we might say, sweet, you're in the kingdom, right? Uh, but every word that I just said there, it means something different to them. And so this is this becomes very—this is why it's so difficult. And at, at the root, like you're saying, uh, even in terms of who God is and who Jesus is— we have very different understandings. And so uh, there is a challenge involved there. Uh, you know, when I was at Chapman University, I was a religious studies major. One of the tasks that we had to do was go to some different uh, churches in the area and uh, sit through a service. So we, had, we go to a, um, um, uh, go to a, 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 a Hindu temple, go, go to a Buddhist uh, service, go to a Jewish service, go to a, a Christian religious service. And so we went to all these services, and I was struck at one of those meetings. I went to a Hindu temple, and uh, the, uh, the main teacher there was, was giving a lesson, and afterward I had a chance to uh, sit down with him and talk. And one of the things that I asked him, I said, well, you know, as you're preaching, up behind you, you had two pictures. You had a picture of Krishna, and you had uh, this picture of Jesus on the other side, and I and I asked him, well, who, why, why do you have a picture of Jesus up there? And he told me, well, because I'm a Christian, because I, I'm a I'm a follower of Jesus. And mm. I thought, well, okay, we obviously uh, don't have the same again the same working definition because for him, Jesus was another avatar of Vishnu, at, just like Krishna, just for a different time. And so, though that person believed that Jesus did the miracles that we'll see in the Bible, though that he believed they had the teaching of grace and love, as you'll see in the Bible, for him, what Jesus was doing before the incarnation is completely and wildly different than what the Christian would hold Jesus was doing before and what he's doing after. And I would say that Mormons are in that same boat. Uh, though they believe in a man named Jesus who did the miracles that he that we see in the Bible and did the teachings that we see in the Bible, at, uh, what Jesus was doing before the incarnation is, again, wildly different because Jesus for them is not co-eternal with the Father in the same way that a Christian will hold. He's not consubstantial with the Father in the same way that a Christian would want to define that. There, uh, Jesus uh, is actually of the same species as I am for the Mormon. And again, wildly different kind of an idea. Uh, we have a very clear distinction scripturally, uh, a very clear distinction between creator and created. Uh, they've blurred that with Jesus, and they, and they would find us as 
uh, really no different than Jesus. He's a um, uh, just a uh, somebody who has. Um, uh, he was the firstborn of the Father, but we are all just sort of. If he's number one, I'm number you know uh, eighteen billion and seven, you know. But he's this. But he. But we're no different. We're uh, in that sense. We're the same species. Uh, and, and, and Jesus, there was a time that the father existed and the son didn't in a personal form. And so there's just, uh, there's a lot of differences there. And literally Jesus would be our brother. Yeah. So in that well. sense, yeah. And he's, he's number one, I'm 18 billion and seven, yeah. uh, Satan also, uh, you know, number nine or something. I don't, you know, uh, there's, we're all, all those spiritual beings are all sort of tied together yeah. in this chain of, of progeny from, Heavenly Father. Yeah, so I think that's important to point out is like, even if we're like, well, there are some similarities on maybe what we believe about Jesus and his earthly life, uh, you know, when, you know, for example, if we're talking about, you know, me versus you, Lauren, and someone says, you know, they're the same person, you know, once, you know, well, they both are men. Well, yes, you know, and they, they both lived in California. Well, yeah. But once you find a difference that is, is, you know, you can't reconcile, you know, you're talking yeah. about a different person. And so when the right. Christian view says Jesus is eternally God, and the Mormon view says, no, Jesus is a created being. Uh, that right. is an unreconcilable difference. We're not talking about the same uh, Jesus. Yeah, uh, exactly. So here really quickly again, and, and this didn't come up, and I wanted it to come up in the last one, is um, uh, what would be the view of God? Uh, they say, hey, well, we believe in God too. Uh, so what would be the, the Mormon kind of understanding of God compared to the Christian view of God? Um, so the traditional view that I think you can trace back to Joseph Smith through his King Follett discourse and then his... Uh, sermon on the Grove, sort of the last couple uh, sermons that he gave, he teaches a eternal uh, progression that there are, um, you know, uh, gods without number, you know, a plurality of gods. And the Mormon will reject uh, polytheism because to them, what polytheism means is the worship of many gods. And they say, well, we don't worship many gods. We worship one God and it's Heavenly Father. Um, and, and so, um, there is a different definition, maybe that's a little more apt and it's called henotheism and henotheism is that belief that though there are many gods, I worship just one. And that is actually a, a Hindu approach at, at a multiplicity of gods. So the Hindu approach, uh, will believe that, yeah, there's a hundred million gods out there, but I am attached devotionally to this one. And that's why sometimes you'll see a Hindu with a red dot on their head. Not all Hindus do that, but the ones that are following uh, Vishnu will put that dot. That's, that identifies them as a, as a devotee of, uh, of Vishnu. So you can have um, henotheism where they believe that uh, there are gods without number, uh, but they are devotionally attached to one specific God, the one who uh, their, their, their progenitor. So they believe that Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother were procreating in the celestial kingdom. Uh, and through that procreation, they gave birth to Jesus, you, me, and everybody else. And that then um, that God desires for us that we one day can become as omnipotent and uh, and and um, uh, omniscient as he is, that we one day can hold that same role that he has with us with our spiritual children in the life to come. So they believe that there's you know potentially uh, billions, if not infinite numbers of gods out there. They're just devotionally attached to the one. Again, that's just, you know, there's scripture. God says, I know not any other God. You know, yeah. he doesn't know about any God. There's no God before him. There's no God after him. There's no God beside him. I mean, he's very, very clear about that. So, yeah. Well, I was, yeah, you, you mentioned it very briefly, but it came in the comments, you know, Slam RN uh, mentioned here, you know, don't, you know, and there's Heavenly Father and there's also Heavenly Mother, uh, which right. again would not be a Christian view. But uh, as, you know, even taught within the, the prophets of the Mormon church that God was once a man uh, that was born from his Heavenly Father, right? And, and then became a God. And so, you know, similar, we, we can do the same, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so God is sort of the prime test case. He was the person who was procreated by another God before him, and that's part of that eternal round and that you know eternal progression of gods. Yeah. He himself was a man on another planet, just as we are. That he progressed, and uh, and as, as a result of his progression, was uh, exalted to his status, and that's the same path, the same progression that you or I are on. And, uh, and in fact, this is another, you know, obviously it's a big difference between our view of, of God, but it's also a difference 
in our, again, another difference in our view of Jesus, that Jesus has an exalted status today in Mormonism because of his uh, obedience, because he lived a good life and did the things he was supposed to do. And so he kind of earned his place. And, uh, and again, we don't think that Jesus had to earn his place. We think that he is, uh, by definition, you know, he is the, the, the greatest of all conceivable beings. And so um, very again, very different in terms of God and Jesus and and man, of course, obviously very different anthropology. Yeah, uh, they they think that we that that uh, distinction between God and men is is not a hard and fast rule, a hard and fast line, but in fact the 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 uh, potential that we have is to become as you know that we can have the same relationship with our spiritual children in the life to come that we have with with our heavenly Father today. Yeah, and that's just uh, you know very foreign to Christianity. Yeah. Um, no, I, that's so good. I, I'm kind of, I'd love for you to kind of get your, th- I'd love to get your thoughts on this as well. This is kind of an approach that I often take is if you look at, um, here, let me, uh, let me pull up a Bible verse here. I was not planning to pull up. Um, but for example, like in, uh, one approach and I have uh, previous podcasts on this, uh, but, uh, from the gospel of John. Uh, so let me pull, um, this up here really quick and switch over. Um, John chapter one, um, you know, we, we often see this idea of in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Uh, he was in the beginning with God. But look at verse three here. It says, all things were made through him and without him, not anything was made that was made, uh, showing that Jesus is the creator of all things, that he has made everything that's made, that he can't also be a created being. And, and right. again, we see lots of things in scripture pointing to God being eternally God, not knowing uh, anything before or after. And what I find interesting is that if you flip uh, here over, uh, let me get to um, in Moroni 818, uh, and I will often present this, uh, and you know, here's we looking at the Book of Mormon, uh, verse 18, for I know that God is not a partial God, neither a changeable being. He is unchangeable from all eternity to all eternity. So I, I guess I mean, I, my question for you is, um, this is one kind of strategy I've used is saying, look, here is God is an unchangeable being. Jesus is God from all eternity to all eternity. How can a Mormon hold to Moroni 818 saying God is an unchangeable being, yet he was created from his heavenly father, was a man that lived on a planet, uh, then became exalted to God. Now he's our heavenly father. How is that an unchangeable being? Well, you're going to have to change your definition of eternity. Hmm. So they've got a different definition of eternity that they work with. And that definition of eternity is something like um, uh, in his exalt since the time that he was exalted um, and before the creation of the world. Hmm. Now he is exalted. And so he will forever be exalted. So, you know, so you have to change. You just have to change. You, you can't work with a, a def, the actual definition of eternity yeah, uh, because it, cause it would fail. And so you have a different working definition uh, of eternity. Okay. Fair enough. Awesome. Well, um, I'm certainly not saying that's right. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying you bring there, that verse up and, and obviously they can't, they can't uh, abide with, you know, a, the view of a progressing God and view that he's been – as he is exalted forever, uh, you know, from all eternity passes. So they have to say, well, eternity from a different perspective, eternity from the, f- for as long as the world has been created, you yeah. know, you have to kind of and change I, the definition. Yeah. And I think, as you pointed out, I think that's one of the difficulties maybe within the Mormon church when Joseph Smith, I, I think in the Book of Mormon and in his earlier writings was very Trinitarian, was very, uh, God is, is kind of the Christian view of God and then kind of changed later on and started saying other things like, I'm going to tell you, you've, you know, in one of his quotes, you know, how, I, how you believe that God was always God. And I'm going to tell you why he wasn't, that there's three separate distinct personages. And, and so anyways, a very interesting. Yeah, I think, I think I, I certainly wouldn't say that he was Trinitarian. I think that he was uh, more modalistic, personally. Uh, that that you that I can I would read his his early writings as more uh, modalistic, but okay. that in time he began to see a separation, and that led him to uh, the plurality of gods. Yeah. But but yeah, but anyway, like you're saying, his the scriptures um, initially don't preach a plurality of gods, but in time, that's sort of where things developed for his thinking 
And so that's the tradition as they have it today. Good. That's a great clarification. Um, All right. So what I want to be the focus of our conversation uh, after kind of, again, getting, I think, some really important points of who Jesus and God are, uh, is focusing in on grace and salvation. And so uh, I've heard you speak on this and it's phenomenal. And I think, you know, one reason is you wrote your doctoral, your dissertation on the Mormon view of grace, you know, versus the Christian view of grace. So here really quickly, you know, why is why is that a topic that you decided to write your dissertation? on was the Mormon view of grace? Well, I think, um, so like, if you want to flip over, you can flip over, uh, with me or, or turn somewhere, but Romans 10, um, I, I, I see in Romans 10, um, a, first of all, a call in Romans 10, 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So that's a great truth of Christian, uh, faith that as we turn to the Lord, which of course that's an interesting Trinitarian thing anyway, because that's quoting from Joel 232, which is which is saying that if anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, like the name of Yahweh, but now here they're applying that name to Jesus, which is interesting. But apply but but calling on him um, as he is, well, you're saved through that, right? And so then he asks in verse 14 and following, Well, how will they then call on him who they have not believed, and how are they to believe in him? Of whom they have not, uh, they have never heard, and how are they to hear without someone preaching? How are they to preach unless they are sent? And I, then I love his next quote from Isaiah, where he says, "How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news." And what he's saying, I think, is that the problem isn't the hiccup isn't with the sending. God has sent us. So the problem is oftentimes with the preaching. We haven't preached to them, and so they haven't heard. And what I think about in Utah, the interesting thing is we haven't. We haven't preached the gospel if at the end of our conversation, the Mormon that we're talking with uh, is it it can say, well, I don't think that what you've said is any different than what I believe. Then we haven't preached the gospel yet. They have Mm -hmm. not heard the gospel because the gospel is different than what the LDS Church teaches. The plan of salvation is different. And so my uh, goal in writing uh, my dissertation and in a lot of the, the thinking that I've done on this is I want to be able to at least get to the place where I can speak with a Mormon friend and come to the end where we say, okay, I see that your church and what your teach, what LDS church uh, teaches and what you're saying about salvation uh, is, are different. They're two things, right? If they just see them as the one, then they can't decide between the two, right? Because it's just, to me, it's all the one thing. And a lot of our, a lot of, uh, I think sometimes our evangelical witnessing, in Mormon circles, we don't always do the good job of defining and getting under the, the terms and things so that at the end they still think it's, oh, I think we're all the same. Well, okay, then I haven't done a good enough job of explaining the gospel yet. And so what I really wanted to do is try to figure out, well, how can I make sure that as I proclaim the gospel, they can actually see there's a difference. I want them to be able to hear, as this text says, the gospel. And if they can hear it, then we can start asking that next question that Galatians 1, 8, 9 asks or, or, or challenges us with. Uh, if one of us is teaching, if one of those gospels is true, then the other one is anathema. You know, the other one is is bankrupt and is, uh, and is relying on it uh, won't get me anywhere in my relationship with God. And so now we've got to try to sort out, okay, if I've preached to you a, a different gospel than the one that you've grown up with or the one that you've heard, well, now you can see this distinction between the two. Now we got to figure out which one's right. And one of them is very wrong and one of them is, is, is right. And so let's do the work and try to sort out how do, we, how do we sort that out. And so then there's a whole variety of other apologetics that are going to kick in at that point. But for me, I feel like I've done something productive with somebody. If I at least get them to see, okay, there is a choice to be made here. And, and now we can start talking about how we make that choice. Yeah, and I think that's exactly why I wanted to have this conversation and have you on is that, and that's another reason why we, as with Maven, we're training students in Mormonism and Mormon theology and doctrine and then taking them to Salt Lake City is is that the gospel has been changed and you you have to know the Christian gospel so well in order to present that, right? You, the Christian has to have a clear understanding of what it is that we yeah. believe. And if you don't, the gospel you present is going to sound the same to a Mormon. And so having this conversation is not just to learn more about Mormonism uh, and not just to have that conversation, but even for those who don't know Mormons in their life and probably won't be having this conversation, hopefully listening will give you a deeper, clearer understanding of what the Christian gospel truly is. And that is something that all Christians should want to to know at a deeper level. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so yeah, absolutely. So when a when a Mormon then so we'll start with kind of the Mormon view of, of grace salvation. Uh, then we'll kind of focus in on on the Christian view, and then again, I, I want to finish with. Uh, I think you have a very easy to use practical approach to use this in conversation, a great conversation starter that we will go over. Um, but what would you? I guess starting off with saying when the Mormon says, "Hey, I believe I'm saved by Jesus too. The grace of Jesus yeah. saves me." Uh, what what do they mean by that? Right. So let me let me uh, let me start where I feel like a, a good starting place is. Um, when we talk about a, a couple things kind of preliminary, uh, and, and a lot of this I, I did, I, I think you mentioned this, I wrote a chapter in um, that book, Sharing the Good News with the Mormons, where I tried to take, you know, 260 pages of dissertation and, and make it into 3,000 words. So, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, 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 gonna, it, it's not going to hit uh, everything, but, I, but, I, but, you know, I tried, tried to kind of distill, I think, what the kind of the, the, the important takeaways are in, uh, in the approach. So um, the important thing, a couple things to think about. Christians talk about grace in a variety of ways. We talk about grace as an enabling power. God gives me the grace that I need today to endure some hardship or something like that. That is grace that God gives me. And that's a good thing. Those are gifts that he gives us. He gives that to us by his spirit and give that to us by uh, other people serving, whatever it is. Okay. So God gives grace that way. He also, what we sometimes talk about is God's saving grace, the grace that he gives to overcome the penalty of sin as I trust in Jesus. You know, that's a, a undeserved, unmerited favor that he gives me uh, that, that's simply in, in, in light of what Jesus did for me on the cross as I trust in that and appropriate that, that, uh, that grace or that, that gift then in my life by receiving Jesus and his work of atonement. So that's a saving grace, right? Now, interestingly, the, the LDS view does have a view of grace, but it sort of all binds those all things together. So they sort of view enabling grace, it seems to me, uh, like they don't have a distinction between a saving grace and enabling grace. The the enabling grace that God gives is, is how he enables you to, through your obedience— um, become a uh, reach your potential, uh, get exalt exaltation and all that kind of stuff. So I want to kind of talk a little bit about uh, how that all works out. If, if this is okay, I'll, yeah. I'll kind of start. I'll start a little bit at the beginning because I feel like for us to understand what grace means to the Mormon, um, at least what what their what the institution teaches about grace. You know what an individual Mormon might believe about grace. I don't know, but yeah. you know that they they sometimes can differ on this. But but in terms of what the LDS Church teaches about it. Uh, I, I want us to understand a little bit about the beginning, uh, and, and at least what I've not uh, the fall. Let's talk about the fall for a minute, um, because for Christians, the kind of the grace that we need is a grace that, that's required because our because of our sin. We've the wages of sin is death, and uh, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and so we need His grace to overcome that barrier that we set. And God, in his grace, has provided the substitute. Mm -hmm. You know, in the very same way as we look at Adam and Eve in the garden, and God said, surely the day that you sin, you, you know, you rebel and, and, and eat of the fruit, you will die. Um, so um, they didn't die, but an animal did, right? God creates the very first animal sacrifice, that very first sin. A death is required to cover their guilt and shame. And so God covers them with animal skins. An animal has to die for them to do that. And that then paints this picture or it starts this cycle that we see throughout the entire Old Testament of God and his grace to his people is willing to accept the death of a substitute. But all those deaths as a substitute are all uh, imperfect and they don't and you have to keep on offering the sacrifices to keep on offering the sacrifices because they don't they don't actually take away the 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 sin the penalty of our sin until Christ comes and is the sacrifice that all those others are just a shadow of he's the reality right and so for a christian that's the you know this is the pro he's get he's paying the penalty the full penalty of my guilt and shame my 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 uh my sin and all of that okay for the for the LDS person, things are working a little bit different. And again, it goes back to the fall. But in, in the picture of the fall, I want to give you, uh, and I'll just take it straight out of my book here. Um, if we wanted to ask the question, what was humanity like before uh, Adam and Eve ate of the fruit? You know, we call that the fall in Christianity. Um, LDS people can use that term, but they don't see it in the same way. And so I want to talk about uh, four things that define humans 
before the fall. So on the on the, so I'll just read these out. Uh, on the one hand, it says we, uh, we they have an intimate relationship with God, and that's you know we see that as He walks with Adam and even the cool of the day, intimate connection with God. They are immortal. So the uh, Mormon church, LDS church teaches that before the fall, Adam and Eve could not die. And there's a lot of Christian traditions that are going to hold that too. So I'm not, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's fine. They also think, and this is where things get a little bit different. They also believe that Adam and Eve were innocent. Um, And what they mean by innocent is they had no capacity for good or evil, joy or sorrow, right? So they had no ability to do something good, to do something bad. Uh, they had no ability to experience joy, they had no experience of sorrow. They had no agency. And agency is a big key word for, uh, for, for LDS people. Well, and then that, here's where things... So here really quick on that. I mean, that seems like, a, a again, an important definition to d- define when we're having conversations, because mm-hmm. I think the Christian would say, well, yeah, Adam and Eve were without sin, so innocent mm-hmm. might sound good. But, yeah. we, but they were experiencing joy with the Lord. Sure. Uh, they were doing good things that God yeah. created them to do. They just did not have sin. So again, that it sounds pretty good. Oh yeah, they're innocent. I can, I can go along with that, but it's a different view when you understand what that means. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. They, were, they, they lacked agency. They had no capacity for good or evil, joy yeah. or sorrow. Yeah. Um, and the last one is one that Christians certainly won't, uh, will certainly reject, and that is that they were incapable of bearing children in this uh, pre-fall state. Uh, that's just the Mormon teaching that before the fall, because they could not do anything good and procreation is good, they could not have children yet. And so you have this, uh, the four eyes, uh, you know, at this point, they, they, they have this innocence before the Lord. They have uh, this, this uh, uh, innocence, also this incapable, they don't have agency yet. They're immortal, so they're going to go on, endure forever. Uh, they can't die, and they're also incapable of multiplying. So that's sort of the, the state of Adam and Eve. Now, they also believe that in that state, God gave them two specific commands. He said, don't eat of the fruit, because if you do, then you'll have the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat of the fruit, he said, and, and, and he also said, uh, be fruitful and multiply. Yeah. Right? So they're faced with these two, in the Mormon conception, they're faced with these two commands, but they're, they can't uphold both of them. Right. So they're in this stuck sort of sense. I, we can't be fruitful, multiply because we can't have kids. Um, uh, and we're also not supposed to eat of the tree. But if we eat of the tree, then that can make us capable of having kids. So they had to figure out somehow how to what to do. And in any case, they eat of the fruit. And when they eat of the fruit, uh, all four of those eyes experience a significant change. So there is a very significant change that goes on for the. Uh, for the uh, for the more for the uh, for Adam and Eve as they uh, as they turn to um, the the eating of the true uh, eating of the tree, so on the one hand their immortality is shifted to becoming mortal, and what this means is in this new state as they eat of the tree, one of the consequences of Adam and Eve as they eat of the tree is they become mortal, which means for the for the Mormon that as they die they're going to go down into the grave and there they'll stay. So they're, they're mortal now. They, they're not going to live on forever. They're going to have an ending point, and that ending point ends with them in the grave. And that's a problem in this state, right? Because we don't want to have our life. That kills our progression. We need yeah. something more than that. But there they are. They're, they're kind of stuck with that, right? Um, not only that, but they also become um, – they have now agency. So they're, they now have – the capacity for joy and sorrow, the capacity for good and evil, that they can now make choices in their life that will honor God or they can rebel against him, and they have degrees of joy and sorrow that that will come as a result of that and just other things in life. They also become descendant capable. They can now have kids, and that's an important one for them so that they uh, are able now to experience good things. One of those good things that they can experience is is bringing children into the world, and that's a, that's a positive for them because they kind of have this view, as you've probably talked about, just basic Mormon beliefs that you've got all these spirit children of Heavenly Father, and He needs to get them embodied so that they can uh, pass the test of mortality well and become exalted. And so they need bodies, and so they need we need procreation going on on Earth. So they're descendant capable now, and now, but now they're also experiencing a little bit of distance between God 
So now they're not walking with God in the cool of the day anymore. And so that's a problem. So there's a couple of those effects of the fall then as they change that initial state. There's a couple of those effects that they would see as overwhelmingly positive. The agency, mm -hmm. they're now descendant capable. And there's a couple of those effects that they would see as uh, basically as negatives. Now you have this distant relationship and, uh, and now also your life is ending at the grave. And so what God does in Christ is for the Mormon, when Jesus comes and he makes the atoning sacrifice for sins, when he does his thing on the cross, um, it, it does two things. It does one thing for every human who's ever lived universally and unconditionally, right? And so I do want to point out that Mormons do have a sense of grace, and this is it. They have a sense of a gift that God gives through the work of Jesus for them. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we understand Jesus is different, all that kind of stuff. But, but what Jesus does on the cross is provide an effect that connects with every human who's ever lived universally and unconditionally. Right? So that means you don't, get to opt out. you don't get to opt out of it. There's nothing you can do to lose this benefit of the atonement. And that, and that, that heals the two pieces of the fall that are a problem. Right. So he 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 gets rid of and they're connected here, but he gets rid of this this life that ends at the grave through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. All humans will be resurrected. You don't get to opt in or out of that. It's universal. It's unconditional. You now will be a resurrected being after you die. So he heals that problem. Uh, universally, unconditionally. Secondly, that distant relationship that you have with God is also healed in the sense that at least at some point, God will bring you into his presence. The Father, you will be in his presence again. If that's, even if that's only for judgment, still you are brought back into that close, intimate connection with God at some future point. And that through, sounds... Uh, yeah, but that, that sounds very similar to the Christian view of we believe that all the dead will be raised and sure. stand before the Father uh, for judgment. Yeah, I do think that there's a little bit of difference, though, because I, I don't think in the Christian tradition that we hold that it's in virtue of Jesus's resurrection that we are resur we will we will have in, in immortal existence, either yeah. in heaven or hell. I think that that's just the way that God creates us. Yeah. Uh, that's just the reality of it. Uh, and that because of Jesus's death and resurrection, we can then um, uh, have a, a life with God in his presence forevermore. But even if he didn't come and he created us, he could, we could still exist forever apart from him. But yeah. that's a different, that's a different story. But, but so, so there's a couple things there now that are positive, but there was these other two uh, pieces that are still existing. And one of those is our agency. And so what the Mormons believe about grace on the one hand, it's universal, unconditional. On the other hand, the grace that we need uh, is also going to stem from uh, our misuse of agency, right? And, and that grace to cover over our misuse of agency is something that is, is, uh, is not universal and unconditional, but it's a conditional grace that we can receive. And that condition, and those conditions are, they list them out in gospel principles or other places, uh, are uh, impossible for a person to actually uh, to actually get. And so it's a, uh, it becomes a very works dominant system because what, what Jesus does essentially for us in the atonement for the Mormon is if, if you think of our progression back into heavenly father's presence and then into exaltation as a stairway that we're working our way through, through our deeds, through, t through the testing of this mortal life, then Jesus, you know, we've sort of broken that stairway in the Mormon view through our, the misuse of our agency. And what Jesus's death then is an enabling grace in that he repairs the stairway so that we can come back into God's presence. But that, that, ability, our ability to actually end up in, in our Heavenly Father's presence in the life to come is wholly dependent on, uh, on my perfect obedience or my, uh, my, uh, my obedience meeting the threshold that's required for me to receive exaltation and progress to that point. Yeah. So you, um, I, no I noticed here just at the, at the end and, and a couple times throughout, uh, you, you, you make a distinction between salvation and then there's times where you see, say exaltation. Uh, could yeah. you kind of uh, maybe explain here really quick um, along with that, you know, what is, uh, why you're using salvation versus exaltation? I think this is so important. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you, you know, this is going to be, a, this is a little bit frustrating for a lot of Christians because uh, Mormons are not typically 
uh, systematic theologians, and they will use those terms sometimes meaning wildly different things. Yeah. Um, for the official sense of it, salvation is the work that Jesus does universally and unconditionally, bringing us uh, again into those resurrected into that resurrected uh, life. To so come. by Jesus we are saved. Yes, Jesus gives everyone salvation. Just by just by his sheer grace. Yeah. So I so a Mormon can say honestly and not being disingenuous that they believe that they are saved by the atoning sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. They are saved by grace through Jesus and his, but and what that means is they're going to be resurrected. Yeah. Now the next piece of it, and this is where things get a little complicated, right? The next piece of it is the question then becomes, and this is something Brad Wilcox is a Mormon, uh, a BYU professor. What he teaches a lot is he has a book called Continuous Atonement, uh, and and he gives a lot of speeches and things. You can you can you know search up Brad Wilcox uh, BYU and see some of his talks. He sounds very he like he sounds very evangelical. What he says is what matters. What's important is yes, you're saved by grace, but then the next kind of level of questions is, and how comfortable will I be in his presence? Hmm. Okay. And, and what, he, what they mean by that is again, the, the Mormon view has three tiers of, uh, of the life to come. And then one kind of bonus tier of outer darkness that, 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 uh, is reserved for, um, uh, apostates or, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the demons or whatever, uh, Satan and his minions, but you've got three tiers. And what they mean by how comfortable will you be in his presence is what tier of that will you make it to? Mm. You've got, you've got the, the telestial and terrestrial and, and, and celestial, uh, um, ending points for, for folks. And even within the celestial, sometimes there's, you know, you got three divisions within that one. And, and so what they're, what he's saying is, yes, Jesus dies for your sins, um, dies on the cross, uh, let me take the dying for your sins part out. He dies on the cross, and through that, through that atoning work, you will be saved into one of those kingdoms. And there's nothing you can do about it. You know, it's you know, uh, basically, uh, it's universal and unconditional. You will have a life to come. Uh, but then the question is, what level will you get? Will you? And 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 God's presence is not equally there in all those kingdoms. And so the Father is in the celestial. Jesus sometimes makes it down to the the next level, and you know he visits a time or two. But you know it's 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 different uh, experiences and intimacy with with our heavenly Father based on where they think you end up there. And so what they're saying is. Jesus gets you into the, into one of those kingdoms, but it's up to you and your obedience to eternal laws that, that are uh, given to us in Scripture or whatever that will determine how comfortable you are or what level you're going to end up in in the life to come. And what they'll say – so salvation is just general. You're going to make it into one of the kingdoms, and that's by grace alone, right, uh, because of the resurrection and all that stuff that we talked about. But then um, uh, exaltation would be if you've made it to that very top place. Exaltation is where you want to be. In fact, they'll define even damnation as anything that stunts your progression or, or that, so that, such that you don't reach your potential. And your potential is to be just like Heavenly Father. And so um, uh, Jesus enables you to make it all the way, but that's going to be up to you to do. That's a conditional uh, uh, reality for you if you measure up to their standards of what, that, of what you have to do to earn that place. Yeah. And I just think that's so important because, you know, as a Christian, we say, you know, is it is through the death of Jesus that we are saved. And we're talking about those who trust and follow Jesus Christ and have sure. repented of their sins are saved. Versus the Mormons say, well, I believe that through the death of Jesus, we receive salvation. But they would say they receive salvation. I receive salvation. Yeah, uh, so do and you, right, the, non, the non-Christian, the non-Mormon receive salvation. And so we're obviously, yeah, the atheists receive salvation too through the death of in Jesus. That sense. Yeah. Right. And so that's why, even though you say, I received my salvation through the death of Jesus, and they go, I fully agree. Well, they would also mm -hmm. agree to the atheist too. And we have to come right. to that uh, understanding. Um, yeah. One of the things I like to talk to them about is that uh, to try to help them s see what I'm talking about is I'll, I'll say, you know, I, I believe that the biblical definition of damnation is an eternity, uh, enduring eternity without the presence of God. And, uh, and so for them to tell me that salvation could, in, could possibly include 
and eternal and eternal existence without the presence of my heavenly Father. I, I just think you've you've um, you've made God so small that that uh, that that's a, a possible definition of salvation. Biblically, that's just not possible. Biblically, uh, eternity separated from Him is just what we call hell yeah. and damnation. And so uh, you must have a, a you know a mistake in your uh, view of how important God is for the afterlife if you think you can be saved and yet not ex- not have an experience of of, uh, of our Heavenly Father for uh, for eternity. Yeah. So before I, I kind of want to switch over to kind of the, the practical approach uh, that you mm-hmm. take to to share the, 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 the biblical view of grace uh, with a Mormon, um, you, you talked about this idea of, okay, everyone receives salvation that is universal, unconditional. Uh, then the question is, how comfortable will you be? And I've heard the term, uh, the impossible gospel uh, within Mormonism, uh, and I'll pull it up here. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, right here in verse 23 at the top, this is a second Nephi, uh, 25, 23. Um, but it says we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is grace that we are saved after all that we can do. Um, so I would just love to hear if you have any kind of comments on this yeah. idea of you. Yeah, you're saved by grace, but after all, you can do. Um, 100%, yeah. Yeah, never. You can never do everything you can possibly do. So this is referred to as the impossible gospel. So if you're saying, yeah. well, how comfortable will you be? Well, you'll never actually reach that comfort level. Uh, what kind of comments do no. you have on, on this? Oh, no, um, you're you're exactly right. So a couple of things about it. So there's there's, uh, um, uh. You know, there's 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 a, a, an idea, a fundamental concept within Mormonism that God will not lay to your charge any work that you can't accomplish. So so you have this this problem that if it, if grace is only something that I get, if if a, if a grace to get me to that highest level of the kingdom, uh, and again they would say that you do need grace for that because you can't walk up that stairway without Jesus's work. So they're going to say, no, 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 you need his enabling power. So they're, they're, they're going to say you still need something to happen. You can't just through your good works make it on your own, but Jesus did what he did. And now it's kind of up to you to uh, earn your way to, to march up those steps through your obedience. Right. Um, and so, so you've got this problem that, that God won't lay to my charge, anything that I can't accomplish. Well, well, what ha- ha- are you, uh, are, are there some things, some good things that you're supposed to do that you haven't done um, today or yesterday? Or So what is all that you can do? Well, all that you can do then is anything that God lays to my charge because he wouldn't give me something I couldn't do. And so they're, they get themselves in this really tough place. If they're going to if they're really going to see how this verse works, then truly they're going to say, well, I'm, I'm never going to be I can't possibly ever have exaltation. Similar thing, um, uh, Moroni 1032 and following makes a very similar uh, comment about the grace to uh, become... Um, I'm pulling uh, it up here. Yeah, thank you. So I get the wording. I don't want to put words in Moroni's yeah, so mouth. Yeah, 1032 says, Yeah, come unto Christ and be perfected in him and deny yourselves of all ungodliness. And if ye shall deny yourself of all ungodliness and love God with all your might, mind and strength, this is the grace sufficient for you. That is, by grace ye may be perfect in Christ. And if and if by the grace of God ye are perfect in Christ, ye can in no wise deny the power of God. Sure. So this is just a classic, you know, uh, evangelical strategy of sharing the gospel. One of the things is when they've really understood that these gospels are different, we're able to then say, well, let's just look at what you're calling your gospel. One of the things that you can point, looking at the verse you pointed out, looking at Moroni 10:32, is that we're able to see that in fact. Um, I, I am not as perfectly repentant and out of my sins as I need to be to receive all that God has for me. Because like he says here, it's an if then. If you deny yourselves of all ungodliness, uh, right? If you've denied yourselves of all of ungodliness. And so you, we can, you can just ask somebody, you know, well, how are you doing with that? Have you, have you went, did you go ahead and deny yourselves of all ungodliness? And if you did, then great. Then he says, then you've got this you know, then God's enabling grace has allowed you through your obedience to work your way up into that kingdom. But, but if you are not right now loving God with all of your might, mind, and strength, then His grace is not sufficient for that. Mm-hmm. And and that's uh, and that should that should be a a, a problem because anyone who's honest, um, I, I don't think is going to be able to say, yeah, I went, I did that yesterday. I went ahead and denied myself of all and God lit us, and so I'm good, yeah. right? Uh, 
And so, uh, so you know, we'll have we'll have uh, LDS people will say, well, that's what the you know, when you die, you you um, you go into spirit prison, and then you can continue that process of refinement. And I remember having a Mormon uh, missionary tell me that one time. Uh, we were we were talking about this exact problem, and they said, well, it's a process; it's not an overnight thing. And so we get to the, you know, we have a. Um, we have when we die, we, we go and we can still continue to progress and work. And I, I turned to Alma 34 and we just read the whole chapter. It's a long chapter. We just read Alma 34. And I remember there are parts of Alma 34 as you get toward the end where they start talking about um, uh, this life is the life that you need to do your repentance. And, uh, and he says, anybody who doesn't do the work in this life, the devil doth seal you his. And, and I remember the, the missionary uh, at that point was – started visibly shaking and closed her book and said, I need to go <laughs> and left the conversation because for her that she'd never come up against, apparently this was at Temple Square. We just had a conversation there and apparently she had just never come to terms with her, her scriptural tradition here that, that yes, you have to really, what it means is God gives you the grace that you need to work your way up. And it's really up to you to deny yourself of all godliness. And you have to do that in this life. And so, um, uh, that was all of a sudden, that reality was all of a sudden hitting them. And that's where that impossibility of that gospel uh, really started to set in for uh, for her that day. And I think that that's an important um, important thing for us to do. Yeah, there you go. If you've yeah. procrastinated the day of your repentance, uh, then you have been, been subjected to the spirit of the devil, and he doth seal you his. And so we say, well, if you have an unrepentant spirit, now, what makes you think you would have an unrep unrepentant spirit? Then he says it's the same spirit that um, that transfers with you, and so it's just it's a whole it's a whole uh, problem. Then that whole chapter is is really kind of try. I mean, Joseph Smith was really an arch arch legalist. He was really saying, no, you you you've got to repent, and you and you don't repent every day. If you're repenting every day, then then it shows you didn't repent yesterday. So you've got to do the work of repentance. And by repentance, what he means is that you've stopped sinning. You're not you're not doing that sin again, because if I did that sin again, I really didn't turn away from it. And so you really have to stop your sinning. You have to deny yourselves of all ungodliness. And if you do all that stuff, then, then you've got the, the enabling grace of God is effective to uh, allow you to enter into that eternal abode with the Father. Wow. Wonderful. Um, I think that's so good, again, to, to have a clarification on what they mean by terms and, and what the Mormon view of grace is. And so as I've been hinting to this entire conversation, I think that the approach that you have uh, in order to have a very uh, practical conversation with Mormons, as well as present the true gospel, I think is, is so easy to use. Uh, and it simply starts with... Um, if you're in a conversation with a Mormon, you don't know what to say. You say, hey, what's the best part about being a Mormon? What's yeah. the best part of Mormonism? And let them share what they love about Mormonism. And then when they get done, you respond and you say, hey, can I tell you the best part of Christianity? Uh, so tell us a little about this uh, approach and, and and the question that you ask. Yeah, and it's not something that that uh, is original to me. I, I can't remember who first introduced that question to me, but it is uh, uh, really one of the more fruitful questions that 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 I'm armed with as I go into conversations with with, uh, with LDS people. Because the hardest part, any you know person who's done any evangelism will tell you that the hardest part of entering into a spiritual conversation is just getting the spiritual conversation going. Once yeah. the conversations are going, uh, LDS people tend to be eager to talk about their faith. I mean, imagine if you were walking down the street and someone said, Hey, could you share the gospel with me? What would you, what would you say? Like, yeah, absolutely. Like a hundred percent. Like I would, I would, I would be great, you know? And so a lot of LDS people feel the same way. And, uh, and so, um, uh, they tend to think with Christians, you know, they tend to think of it as they're not, they're not, uh, uh, they're not fearful of Christians typically because they believe something like in the back of their mind, you know, they're the varsity team and we're the JV team. You know, they, we have some truth, they have more truth. And so they're fine to interact with a Christian about, uh, about spiritual things typically. And so when you start asking them, what are some of the best things, you know, about, uh, about your LDS faith, it, it's pretty typical. You'll find some things about, well, there's a, you know, the Heavenly Father's plan of happiness is great. I love that I'm going to be with my family for uh, for eternity. You know, there's some some basic things that'll come up, and and then yeah, that typically you know, and that's just sort of human nature. If if I'm asking you the best things about your faith, well, can I share with you some of the best things of my, about my faith? And uh, and and okay, you know, and so then we start talking about. Well, I think the best thing uh, about faith is that that uh, that God's grace is free. Now th this is going to be kind of 
like we've said, they will probably want to agree with me at this point, right? Because they're like, oh yeah, absolutely. You know, because they have their own views of grace and some of those pieces of that grace are free and unconditional, universal, all of that. And so, um, and so then, so then I'll say, well, uh, has, has a, have you ever had a Christian, an evangelical Christian share the gospel with you before? And sometimes they say, yeah, and sometimes they say no. If they say, yeah, then I might put some feelers out. Well, what, tell me what they said. Tell me how they explained it to you. Uh, or, or if they say no, then I'll say, well, can I, can I share with you this best part of what I think Christianity has to offer? Um, can I share with you what I mean by that through, uh, just looking at a couple of scriptures and I don't know, I feel like most of the time people are, are open to that. Yeah. I don't feel like they're closed off. I think that they're like, okay, why not? You know, I believe in the Bible insofar as correctly translated. You've got a Bible you want to use to, to, to share some things with it. It can't hurt, right? Go ahead. Yeah, I'd love to hear it. And so it's a pretty easy entry, I feel like, into conversations, even even if they're going to give me a, initially that, no, 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 I believe in free grace too. Okay, well, has a Christian shared the gospel with you? And if they say no, then as, can I do it? If they say, yeah, what did they tell me what, again, tell me what they said. And maybe can I uh, clarify a few things and, and, and usually they're okay with it. Right. And so one of the things that I like to do, and I highlight this in my chapter is uh, start in the old Testament. So I start in uh, Genesis chapter 15 um, because uh, uh, this is, this is foundational. I feel like for how God relates, relates to uh, his people. This is a a a, uh, a movement forward for how he how he connects uh, his covenant uh, of promise to us today. And so I'll I'll, int- I'll read this uh, passage in in, uh, in Genesis 15, and specifically we get down to verse 12. So if you can see verse 12 there, you know you you can set the stage a little bit here. You know I don't know how much you know about covenants and. You know, one of the ways that you would make covenants in in Old Testament times was you would take an animal, right, and you would you would split it in half. So you'd actually tear it in half, and each party would walk through that uh, that animal. And what they were saying is, uh, in, in a very symbolic, rich symbolic way, they're saying, "Be it unto me as it is to this animal, if I do not uphold uh, my commitment to you." Right. So typically you have obligations. The, the more, pow- more, more pow- powerful uh, party will, will have obligations for the lesser, and he'll have some responsibilities. So this would be more typical in a sense of um, ancient treaty law where you have a, uh, a, a powerful nation saying, I won't kill all your people. You give me X numbers of silver and gold a year, right? And so uh, you would make, and sometimes, you know, we have that even common uh, uh, expression today is sign it in, in in blood, you know? Essentially, that's what they're doing and they're walking through these animals. They're saying, <laughs> yeah, my life's on the line with this thing, you know? Yeah. And so then we look at verse 12 here and we look at this this covenant that God has made with Abraham and and uh, or Abram at the point, but we can talk through the, the kind of promises. I'm going to give you a land, I'm going to give you a great nation, and, and, and through you and, and your seed, all the nations, all the families of the earth will be blessed, right? He gives them those three promises, and then and then he says, I'm going to make those that covenant with you about these. And he uh, has Abraham t- you know, cut the animal and, and lay it there. And then it says in verse 12 that as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham and behold, dreadful uh, and great darkness fell upon him. And then, and then the Lord says, so know for certain all these things that I'm doing in your life. Right. And so it says in verse 17, when the sun had gone down, it was dark. Behold, a smoking fire pot and flaming torch passed between the pieces. And so there we have God uh, as, as uh, uh, represented through the fire, which is oftentimes, you know, you've got the burning bush and you've got the pillar of fire by night leading his people. And you've got the fire that descends on Mount Sinai. You've got this, this uh, rich concept again, biblically of God uh, showing up in this, uh, in this, this fire, which is, you know, a, a, both a life giving and also terrifying, uh, you, you know, God in his holiness, you get too close, you get, you know, disintegrated. And that's kind of what fire does. Right. But, but God works, he, he, God moves his way through the, through the pieces while Abraham is, uh, is asleep. And so I will, you know, as we read through this and we look at this passage, I'll sit there and I'll say, well, now, now tell me, you know, um, who, who is obligated in this covenant? Who went through the pieces? And, and, and I'll, and I'll have, have the, you know, 
look, they'll look at it and they, well, it's it, the, the, the smoking fire pot, you know, it's, it's the, the, uh, the symbolic presence of God has moved through it. And, and I'll ask them, what do you think it means that Abraham doesn't move through it? Right. And, and it's just an interesting moment. It's something that they haven't typically ever seen before. So I, I actually took, you know, before I moved to Utah, um, I went to a, uh, Near almost every university, the LDS Church has a, uh, an institute of religion, right? Uh, and so I started going to the Institute of Religion in Fresno before we moved to Utah uh, uh, because you can take classes there. You can take uh, Book of Mormon. You can take Old Testament, New Testament. You can take classes where you will, where they, this is for them to teach LDS people, but they're open to visitors too. And I went to them and said, look, I'm going to be moving to Utah before too long. And so I'd kind of like to just learn a little bit about Mormonism and how you understand scripture. And I took an Old Testament class, a New Testament class, and a Book of Mormon class from them. I really wanted to take, I think it's like six classes. If you take six classes, then you get a certificate signed by the prophet that says you're, you know, you know, Mormon stuff. And I was like, ah, oh, really, I think that'd be cool to get, but <laughs> I, I, I didn't make it through. They, they, um, uh, ended up, uh, through a whole, you know, different story asking me to be done taking classes with them, but I was super good in the class. Like I wasn't going to chat or I wasn't going to sit there and try to argue evangelical positions or anything like that. But I remember in the class in the Old Testament, we started looking at this passage and, uh, and, and I'm, I distinctly remember the teacher saying, God makes a covenant right, with Abraham in virtue of his obedience of Isaac, uh, of offering Isaac on the, on the altar. And so he had this understanding that, 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 that Abraham had somehow earned this covenantal arrangement that God makes. And I, I raised my hand and I said, don't you think it's a little bit instructive that the covenant happens in Genesis 15 and the Isaac bit doesn't happen until Genesis 22. So do, don't you think there's something to that? And, and, and that was one of those like, Lauren, I need to talk to you after class kind of moments, you know? And I was like, I, I don't, I don't think that that's all that controversial, like 15 comes before 22, right? Just a math question really, right? But then, but then it comes, well, why? So, but why is that? That is important though. That's a big distinction because what we see here is that Abraham is um, uh, not held to obligations at this point, but God is. And that obligation particularly is that through his seed will come one who will become a blessing to all the families of the earth. And so that's the first step, right? If I can get them there, if I can get them to see like, wow, that is pretty radical. Like that's interesting that God would make a covenant with somebody and that that covenant has obligations for God, but no requirements on Abraham. That's unique. Yeah. Uh, uh, so then I say, okay, well that's, that is unique. That's pretty powerful. Right. And so, so, well, let's, can you, let me just, you know, bear with me. Let's look, can we look at a verse in the new Testament? I want to turn over and look at a passage in, in Romans, because the passage in Romans chapter four, uh, I commend the people read the whole chapter, right? But, but it's a powerful chapter because it connects what God was doing with Abraham with me and it connects it with all of us. And so he talks about, uh, Abraham, of course, again, reinforcing Abraham was not justified by works says in verse two, uh, Abraham, uh, believed God and it was counted to him or credited to him as righteousness. And then he kind of gives us definition in verse four to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. But the one he says, and the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Abraham, the ungodly is justified by trusting in this covenantal promise that God gives him. He enters into this covenant, and so he's the recipient of those covenantal promises, not because he's earned it, but because he trusts that God will be faithful to keep up his covenantal word. The whole passage, you know, continues uh, speaking about this promise that he made. In fact, it zeroes in in, in uh, chapter four, talking about the offsprings, particularly that uh, that God had promised him. Uh, showing us that 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 uh, that that offspring, that seed, was uh, was Jesus. Like that, in Him, then all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And then He says this, and this is really kind of the the key moment here, as as we look at verse twenty three. If you want to scroll down uh, and look at four twenty three, it says, uh, "But the words it was counted to Him." Uh, speaking of that covenantal moment that God has with Abram. 
uh, the words that was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. And so we see here that what God tells us is that that same way, that same covenantal process that Abraham went through, that, that Abraham who believes God and it's credited to him as righteousness, that he trusts him and God then makes that covenant and those covenantal promises to him. Uh, we have that same process is the same process that God is going through with us through Jesus, that, that as we trust in him, uh, God, the obligations are on Christ. He bears the full burden of, the, of those covenantal commitments to us, and he gives us then this new relationship with us through trusting in him. And so I like to try to walk my way through that example of the Old Testament. I feel like it's really clear there what was going on and then show how in the New Testament they say, that's the very same way God says he relates to us today. Yeah. Wow. Uh, that I think is so good. And, and, you know, hearing you explain that again, uh, it kind of solidifies even more. And this is something that definitely we can practice. But I think, it, as I mentioned, it's very easy and practical because, again, saying, hey, what's the best part about uh, the LDS faith? What do you like about it? Uh, can I share what I, I think is the best part about Christianity? And this is free gift of salvation. Here we see it uh, given to Abraham. Here's how that relates to us. Uh, mm -hmm. And really, again, if we are called to preach the gospel, if that is this, the core of Christianity, that is the good news that we have uh, a need to bring I think that is a very simple way to bring it. And again, as, as you mentioned, the hardest part about getting in conversations is getting it started. Yeah. But, I, but the simple question of, hey, what's the best part about your faith? Can I share the best part about mine? Right. You know, if, if that's a friend and, and, and you're on walks with and you're doing things with, uh, that's a very easy way to enter into something so beautiful about Christianity. Absolutely. And I feel like what we've talked about here, we'll get that ball rolling. Uh, hopefully it gets the, the wheels turning and it starts to highlight that difference between what they think their obligations to God are and what the, the biblical witness is. Now that's going to lead to all kinds of other verses and, you know, um, uh, you know, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and, and just a myriad of things that we might want to touch on. You know, first John, uh, five, uh, 11 through 13 is incredibly important to me because it tells us that, that, that God wants us to know that we have eternal life. Yeah. He, he says he writes these things to us that you may know. It's what I say. This promise gives me that confidence. I can know that I have eternal life because it's not based on my performance. It's based on God's promises. In yeah. the same way that covenant with Abraham, he could know that those promises will be faithful because God is a faithful God. And he's made promises that are unconditional. They're not dependent on Abraham's ability to live something out to gain those promises. They're just rich grace. They're just given to him in the same way uh, I can know that I have uh, e life with, with God, eternity with him to look forward to because he's uh, promised that to me in faith as I trust in Jesus. And so I can trust that God is faithful. So I can know that. That's something Mormons really struggle with. They feel like they can never know where they stand with God. And, uh, and I, I'm, I've had conversations with, with, uh, with Mormon missionaries on that verse alone also, and just sort of to start that ball rolling of the distinction, because I'll say, you know, the book True to the Faith is a, a Mormon manual that all missionaries have access to, and, and, and uh, you know, you find it. It's a very popular. It's on their website and everything. But one of the things that it says is you try to define eternal life or salvation. It says if you're trying to define salvation, uh, meaning eternal life, meaning having that that uh, eternal relationship with Heavenly Father. If that's what you mean, he says, then no man can know in mortality that they have that gift. And I'll look at that, look at 1 John 5 and say, well, why would your church teach you that you can't know that when, when the Word of God tells you you can know that? Hmm. Uh, it does say, in fact, and I've checked the JST and it doesn't change that. It still says the very same thing, right? So, so why would your church teach you something differently? And, and then that starts to highlight this difference. Well, how come as the gospel that I trust in, I can know where I stand with God and, and on yours, you can't know, yeah. right? And mine's lining with scriptures is not. Let's talk about that. Let's get into this conversation now about the gospel, about why that's different. Yeah. And so that, you know, the, you mentioned the JST, that would be the Joseph Smith translation. Um, now, uh, I know we are running out of time, but there, there's one practical question that came in, but I think one one kind of follow-up question on this, and I think that you taught it to us. And as I uh, use this strategy, uh, when we went to BYU and we went door to door at BYU student housing, and I was t and a, a, um, a husband and wife invited me into their place, and I sat down and talked to them. Um, 
But uh, one thing that uh, is often responded is when you have this free gift of salvation, it is granted based on faith that often the rejection will be, well, then you can just go on sinning and you can kind of do all these things. And I think it was you that mentioned they will often bring up that objection uh, of then, well, then you can just go on sinning. But that's also the objection that Paul brings up. And so it's almost as if you are teaching the true gospel, this is the objection you should receive (laughs) because that's the objection that Paul says. And by the way, this is then what we'll say, and here's my response to it. Versus if you are not teaching possibly the the true gospel, uh, then you may not receive that objection because there is something so unique and beautiful about the free gift not based on our works that then leads to saying, well, if it's not based on your works, well, then why do these things? Yeah. Oh, man, that's so good. And that's right. And, and I'll, I'll say that right to them whenever that objection comes up. And it does almost every time. Right. Yeah. So I can just get, live like hell and go to heaven kind of a thing. Right. And uh, and, and so I'll say, well, I, you know, I have some things I'll, I want to tell you about that. But but I will like you just said, that's the first thing that Paul knows is going to come his way. And so at several points in the Gospel of Romans or in the book of Romans, as he's sharing the gospel, he highlights that same objection several times in the response to it. And I'll say to them specifically, if when you share the gospel with someone, that charge would never be laid upon you, then maybe you're not teaching the same gospel that Paul was teaching, uh, that the New Testament teaches, right? And so it's just a way to start that, like, oh, like, okay, that's interesting. I, I don't, and then, and then we start talking about, okay, so let's talk about where works fit in. And there's, that's a whole nother discussion. Yeah. And it's a, it's worthwhile one to have, obviously. Yeah. Wow. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I, 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 I love that, 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 came up and I love that you were able to use that because that is um, uh, really is something that you will get every time when they start to really see how d- uh, distinct and different this is it, it really is just completely leaning on Jesus okay so, so then what we can just you know do whatever we want so it's like a pretty pretty natural response I think yeah that is so which good. is good now, now they're starting that now you know they're starting to hear it though yeah you're starting to hear it. And I like yeah. to just mention like, well, man, it just lets me, the gospel then frees me to really love my God. I can really love him with my life because if I, if I, if I'm constantly doing the things that I'm doing to try to get something from him, I'm trying to earn something from him, then all of my deeds, all my good deed doing is ultimately self-reflective. It's mm. always, I'm doing it for me because I need to get something that God has to offer and I need to earn that from him. So I'm, I'm not really loving him with my deeds so much as I'm loving myself yeah. with those things, trying to get something for me. Whereas as in Christianity, you know, we don't have, uh, we don't have the ability to say, hey, you got to do X, Y, and Z to get what God has for you. We can't hold that over people. What we say is God's already given you everything, right? Mm-hmm. He's given you the whole deal when you trust in him. Well, now that gives me the opportunity for the rest of my life to uh, to worship. So my, uh, my living, my day-to-day life is an act of worship because I can love God with my life now. I'm not trying to gain something from him because he's already given me everything. Yeah. And so it's a really cool Thing. I think people understand that intuitively after a while. They'll start to understand, yeah, you know, you love your wife and, and you hold her hand, not because you're trying to get something from her, but because you love her. Yeah. You know, you, you do, you do, you love your kids. So you provide for their needs. You're not trying to get something from them, but you love them. And so you, you care for them. Like we do things all the time for people in a, in a way that's not trying to get something from them. Yeah. And that's really what I think is going to really help us see what real love looks like. And so I think that's what I start. That's where that conversation starts to go. And it's a really cool conversation to have. Yeah. Cause you'll start to see some clicks and some like, okay, well, yeah, I, I can see how that, see how that fits. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, along with a lot of the strategies, it gets the conversation going, it gets them yeah. thinking, and it leads yeah. another way. And that gives you more kind of questions that need to be answered and more topics maybe that you need to, to study. But right. um, Lauren, I, I just think, uh, man, I, I just thank you so much for this time, because I think, man, there is nothing more beautiful than focusing in on what the true gospel is. And I think that, you know, oftentimes in apologetics, it's like, you know, I'm looking at arguments and evidence and science and, and, and trying to always bring it back to the gospel. But really, when you're saying here is a beautiful picture of the gospel, and sharing it to him. Uh, it doesn't get any more clear than that. So I just thank you for taking this time to do that with us. Uh, I want to finish up. There's one kind of practical question uh, that came in here. Um, and it is here from my dad. Uh, he says, I've shared an office for about 20 years with Mormons. We get along great. We've never talked about our respective faiths. We get along great. Should I leave it at that? Or what safe approach is there? It's a great question, right? And um uh, I, I'll get good news and bad news, right? Um, is there a safe approach? Well, 
<laughs> Jesus said, I didn't come to, 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 to bring peace, but division. So at times the gospel will bring some tension, I think, into relationships. And so is there a safe way? I don't, I can't, I'm not going to tell you that there's a safe way because I think Jesus teaches us that sometimes as we preach the gospel, we're going to offend some people. The gospel is offensive a little bit, right? And, um, and so I can't tell you it's a safe way, but I do think that there are safer ways, right? <laughs> and, and, uh, and that some of what we've been talking about today, uh, are safer ways in the sense that you really want to, on the one hand, show some respect to the people by really trying to understand where they're coming from. And that's what I tried. I mean, my whole, like I said, uh, like we talked about, my whole dissertation was about I want to really understand what Mormon grace is um, before I just start coming and lambasting their, their, you know, false gospel or something like that. Let's, yeah. let's make sure that I really get it. So, so I think one of the things that you could, what's safer is to really try to understand where he's at with things, first of all. And that may mean you know, um, the simple question that we talked about, Hey, what's the, your LDS, right? Doug, you know, whatever the guy's name is, uh, what's the best part about that for you? And you start with that, right? That's a great, that's just a pretty safe, innocuous kind of question. See what that opens up. You know, if that allows you to share, can I tell you about, again, like we said, what's the best part about my faith tradition? That's awesome. If it doesn't lead to that right then, you know, you can ask him some follow-up questions, but I think, I think starting that conversation is great. I think you'll be surprised actually, uh, at the engagement that you'll get from somebody as you start asking them just a few questions. Hey, what'd you do on Sunday? Oh, you went to church. What's church like for you? Um, I understand Mormons, you know, had some changes in their services the last couple of years. What is that? What's that been like for you? You know, mm -hmm. you, you just see where it goes. Yeah. I think those are safe. I think that the unsafe approach is, you know, you don't want to come up to his desk and say like, Hey, Doug, I understand you're Mormon. Can I give you the three false prophecies that make me think your religion of Joseph Smith that makes me think that this thing's bankrupt, right? You, that's not, that's not, that yeah. may not be the safest approach. So I don't think there's a foolproof safeness because at some point what you're going to have to say is I think that the faith tradition you're a part of is uh, not getting you where you're hoping it's going to get you. And, and, you know, I think that that is, uh, that can be divisive. It just, but that's what, Paul does with his Jewish friends. That's yeah. what he does to the Gentiles. He does it with gentleness and in love. But like Jesus said, you know, sometimes people are going to, uh, you're going to see mother and daughter divided and father and son divided on this, on this thing on, on what they do with me and if they're going to follow. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Lauren, thank you so, so, so much for taking this time, for laying this out uh, for us and kind of giving us a very practical strategy. I hope that uh, it, it is very helpful and beneficial, not only to those listening to understand uh, what Christian view of grace is, but the Mormon view of grace, and then actually have these conversations where they're sharing the gospel uh, with people. So Lauren, thank you so much for taking this time with us today. You bet, man. Appreciate it having me. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so for those of you watching, as always, uh, if you enjoyed it, please help. Uh, pass the word along, like it, subscribe, hit, maybe hit that little bell, share it on social media with a family or friend. You can subscribe as well to see other interviews that are coming up. My next scheduled one is Jay Warner Wallace talking about evidence for God, so that should be fun, as well as there's a few more down the line in the future that I'll be telling you more about as well. There are other interviews that you can see up here. There are gonna be other videos that pop up here uh, that you can see, uh, but along with that, I hope that you guys have been encouraged by this. If you want to support financially, you can, at the link below. You surely don't have to. Everything is free. But if you want to do that, I would uh, really appreciate it. It would be a huge blessing. So thank you guys so much for taking this time today. Uh, continue to think deeply about God, about Christianity, because God, Jesus, the gospel is absolutely worth thinking about. My name is Ryan Polly. Have a wonderful rest of your day, guys. See ya.